Erickson from the Alaska State Museum, and I'm moderating, and also I'll be presenting, uh, making a little presentation at the end of this session, but I'd first like to introduce the speakers here. We have Robin Wright, Doreen Whitler, and Lisa Lang. They're going to be up first, and then we have Dekaheen Maynor and Steve Brown. So they'll be, uh, we'll start with Doreen, Lisa, and Robin, and then we'll go to Steve, Dekaheen, and myself. Hawa hawa di ten la se sik a kwan ka il juice hinadi ki ang di yalang kis hata is kan kil dagang um um si ayat la sa um demanakan king um I'm trying to think my best in Haida um forgive me if I make any mistakes. Um, I, my Haida name is Pe'il Juice, and I ask to be called Pe'il Juice in public. I like to use my Haida name. And I said today is a beautiful day. Um, I wanted to thank all you good up north people for welcoming us, um, Haidas. And if you can't hear me, I'm sorry Stella's giving me the... Anyway, I, um, coming back to Sitka for me, Pe'il Juice, I went to high school here. I, what I told you was my mother is a Heidelberg Haida and my father is a Sintian. And um, coming back here has been very, very, very um, rewarding. I have family here um, and I have a lot of good memories here, a lot of good memories. I feel very loved and I thank the Sikupan and all the good people. Today my family was asking me, what do you do, Lisa? What is it that you do? And by trade, I'm an attorney. That's what I am as my occupation. I gave up um, doing a lot of that about three years ago and moved home to my village and started working on something called Hadas Kilkrias. It's called the XKKF. It's an offshoot of the Heidelberg Culture Camp. Um, my boss is Doreen Whitware, my tribal administrator boss is here today, but I'd like to also introduce you to two of my members of Hadas Kilkrias. That means my precious Haida words. Um, Doreen Whitward is one of our directors on the XKKF, as is Dr. Wright, Dr. Robin Wright. We have our mayor, Anthony Christensen, is our other director. Jean Bland is one of our other directors. Um, we have a small board, and I wanted to say this publicly. My Aunt Frida said to say this. It is an all-voluntary free board. I have Dr. Wright. I have I have. Doreen's 40 years of experience. I have people's policy. All of the Haidas got together and said, what can we do to help ourselves? Our language is dying. It's leaving us. Our culture is leaving us. What do we do? This is a result of what a group does when they come together and they make something beautiful. And I see the. I came, uh, spent a week here for the cultural tourism, and I got a lot of strong ideas from the Tlingits here because you have culture that is based like us. It's based on your elders and your children, and we have to start giving back. So with that, um, I'm going to go through a, a presentation. There's a young woman that comes up. We have a lot of people who give. Uh, we're based on giving. It's volunteer. If you come to Heidelberg, you're invited to our next culture camp. It's July 23rd to the 28th. We're putting up four polls this year. Um, a big part of that is giving, and I would ask you, if you come to our village, the only thing I ask you to do is to help out. You have to help. So um, um, how do I convey to you the strong emotion comes with losing our language and our, our um, arts, the apprenticeship, the masters, all the good things that come with your culture. Here's how you convey it. You put it into, I can't point, that's very rude. You put it into um, pictures. And we have a volunteer in Heidelberg, her name is Krista. She lives in LA and she does a lot of filming for us. This is a 2009 clip I'm gonna show you. And um, before I show you the clip, I'm gonna ask my boss, one of my bosses, if she'd like to say a word. Three. My name is Dorian Winkler. I'm the tribal administrator for Heidelberg Property Association, and I started working there in 2004. And at the time, we did have culture camps. 
but it was based on time and funding and getting people involved. So when I took over the tribe, we decided to do it as a volunteer, voluntary basis, on a voluntary basis. And so all of our staff was involved. And through this process, it really grew. We've had culture camp now for 15 years, and each year it's getting bigger. The last four years, we've um, replicated poles from our totem park, and we've gotten eight up so far this year, uh, up to this year. We're working on four to raise this summer. And as Asa said, we have culture camp every summer, the last full week of um, July. And the way we've been able to do this, the first time we, the first funding we received was from our BIA road project. Because our road paving project went right through the middle of town. And we were afraid that with the age of the poles, the, um, it would make the totems fall down. So we were able to fund. But after that, we, we tried to use their discretionary funds. We have the group in town which are the entities, the city, the and corporation, and the tribe. And we, these three groups funded our town project for the last two years. This year we got a legislative grant of $200,000, and uh, that's funding our project this year. We have um, a program with four master carvers, and we hire apprentices every year so that we're teaching the younger people in town, and we also encourage school children to come out and uh, go to the carving shed. People in town come down, everyone volunteers. But through this process, we've been able to raise these goals and uh, teach our children. And with the culture camp, we also do um, many other activities. We, we teach eating, weaving. We take the kids out hunting and fishing, and so by, in that way, we're teaching them what the elders taught us. We have many, many things going on throughout the year. Also, we do the area classes, dance classes, language classes, and so we're really working hard without money to try to preserve our, our kind of culture. Um, the tribe has mainly been the driving force behind these projects, but with the formation of our new nonprofit, the Food Trust in Charge, we're um, really seeking funding for now. We've just got a grant from Master City, and so we're getting started there. We're hoping to set up an endowment to further fund all of these projects that um, we've started, mainly just through hard work and volunteers in the community, and everyone working together. And so it's really been successful for us. Um, we um, have to thank our carvers also, because though they are master carvers, they take a big cut in the pain. We've been able to um, produce these things for about 50000 dollars which is a small, a minimal amount of money for them. What the cost now? And our apprentices take like twelve dollars an hour just to do it to involved. So it's been a really great program for high group. If any of you have any questions, come and ask. I can give you information on how we started, how we're keeping it going, and um, what we really believe is great for our children because we believe that through our culture we're going to reach our children. We're teaching them who they are. And then be proud of themselves, have more self esteem, you know, it's just a great project. I'm going to show you a little clip here, real fast. Doreen acts real nice, but she's a taskmaster, man. She's tough. Everyone's scared of her, and she looks nice because they're scared. And she's really good at managing money. That's why our programs are on top. You know, you have to have a financial person. But we're going to do a little clip on, this is 09 in Heidelberg. It gives you a little taste of our village. So enjoy the clip. I'm going to 
hung up right there, so <laughs> um, we'll end that, and that one back, okay. all right, so, um, how, uh, um, it's a, it was a great honor for me uh, when I was invited to be on the board of Hadash for Puyas um, last year, a, year, a little more than a year ago, and uh, they invited me up to Culture Camp. So that video was 2009, and I went up last July 2011. And um, I said, well, what can I do? And well, they said, well, you got to help. you got to help. And so I thought, well... What can I do? Um, I, I arrived and uh, they were doing these uh, tables around the gymnasium with uh, sustainability and so the kids were going out one day, they picked the berries, the next day they made jam and uh, they, they preserved it and, and uh, they were learning about sustainable um, uh, plants around the area. And at another table they were weaving cedar bark and making headbands and uh, hats and there were button blanket and making all kinds of things going on in this gym and and uh, what could I do? Well, I thought well, what, the only thing I think that I might be able to that might be fun would be to to bring up the genealogy chart that I had worked on when uh, I was working on a book on Northern Haida master carvers and had been researching the people from Heidelberg that were related to the people down in Masset. Um, and there's some strong family connections there because the people migrated north from from uh, Haida Gwaii sometime in the 17th century. Uh, and I brought this. Little, it was a little well, not little, but it, I, it was a small, much smaller chart. And we laid it out on the table. And over the course of the whole week, people came by and added in, and were very generous sharing their their family history. And so now it's about 12 feet long and. Um, it's a, just an astonishing thing, and it was so uh, amazing for me to be able to bring this information back to the community where they were linking back several generations into the names of people that I had read about in Explorer's Journals from the late 18th century and bringing it right down to the day. So I'm hoping we can do that again maybe this summer, and uh, I'm looking forward to coming back. But in the evening one night, I, uh, they asked me to do a little... Um, PowerPoint presentation, and I kind of shortened that up for however much time we have left here. I'm going to see how much time we have. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that um, the people uh, who moved up here to uh, southeast Alaska came from here, north end of Haida Gwaii, uh, and in particular uh, Fiusta over here, um, and they moved across to Kaigani here. Uh, and then uh, Haukan and uh, Heidelberg, right here, Heidelberg up here, and Koyanglis, Haukan is here, I guess, Koyanglis, and the little players, um, 
So I'll just show you uh, the people who live in Heidelberg today come from these old villages, Kaigani, uh, the closest one. You can actually see Heidelberg from Kaigani on a clear day. Uh, and these are some of the old poles that were stand still standing there. Um, and this would have been in the uh, 1880s or so when this photo was taken. Kunkwan. Um, the reason I got involved with this sort of genealogy stuff was that the all the, the women who married into the Idensu family came from this village. And um, so um, Kleonglis as well, a uh, village not a lot of people talk about, but some of the uh, poles that are in the Heidelberg Totem Park come from this village and Haukan. Um, <coughs> and moving north up uh, towards uh, Heidelberg, we get to Sequan, which is right across. You can see it from Heidelberg and these poles uh, all inspired the models that were made for the totem park in Heidelberg. So this is a little map that I lifted out of one of the previous uh, researchers' uh, publications that shows that there's a dot for each pole. And I've gone in and put in the village they came from. And um, of course, there are some new ones. Uh, this one was just raised in 1998. Um, and I, I think uh, the, for the remainder of my time here, I just want to show you old and new and uh, the continuity that's going on. So this is the way the totem park looked after it had weathered quite a bit. As you know, these parks were put up during the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, period in the 1930s. Um, and uh, they hired carvers. Uh, John Wallace was the principal carver from this village. Uh, and uh, this is the way the totem park looked last summer. And so you can see there are eight new poles that have been put up in the last four years. Um, <coughs> and uh, this is the, was the principal carver, T.J. Young, who was uh, directing all of the carving last summer. I guess he's not going to be there this summer because he's uh, apprenticing with Robert Davidson this year. So um, he, uh, he was responsible for, for what was going on in the, where they restored. They took down the old poles that had weathered quite a bit and laying them up with the logs and had them right side by side when they were uh, uh, carving them. And so the John Wallace pole on the left and the T.J. Young one on the right. Uh, and then they had a, a blessing by the elders uh, that, was, that was going on here. And they moved the poles. Uh, I think the, the ones that got to ride the pole were the children of the carvers, right? Yeah. Or some of them. Uh, uh, so this happened on two different days at the end of the culture count. They raised two poles. These are the two that they raised last year. Um, and I'll just show you the one on the corner <coughs> uh, towards the street. The, uh, the first one to go up last year was uh, uh, from the uh, representing a pole from Cleonglis. And this is the way it looked in the old village. And on the left is the Heidelberg 1930s pole, and this is the one that went up last year. So there you see three generations of poles. <laughs> and then uh, the second one that went up last year is the one on the left, and it is from Sukwan, and this is it here in the, the uh, CCC totem or first totem park pole, and this is the original pole in Sukwan. Uh, if we go down the row uh, next to the church here, um, you'll see these two poles uh, that have the whales on the top, and this is a color view of, of the way it looked uh, uh, back about 10 years ago, the, the CCC pole. This is the old one from Haukan, one of them. Uh, both of these are uh, Haukan poles, and these are the new ones that have gone up. Did these go up in 2009, I think? The two new poles in that row. Uh, this one hasn't been replaced yet. Is this, this one of the ones that'll uh, be replaced for this coming summer? summer um, from Klinkwan. So that's still standing there right now. And uh, that in the back corner here uh, is uh, James Spoon pole from Klinkwan the way the CCC park looked in the 70s and 
Um, this is the old pole that was in Quinquan in the late 19th century. And you see the boardwalk here out in front of the gorilla poles that still stood in the, this was about uh, uh, the turn of the century, 1900. People moved from this village 1911 up to Heidelberg. And this is the new one that they, they left unpainted. Um, and that was the choice of the, the they're going to paint it in the future? Oh, okay. They, they oiled it, yeah. <clears throat> and then moving down the row, uh, this one has not yet been re replicated. Is this going to be this summer too? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's his pole from Hauken. And looking at the old photo of Hauken, this is that pole here. And um, back in the uh, in the back here, you'll see this pole, which was Kulka's pole, uh, Thomas Kulka's house in Hauken. Uh, I have a particular interest in, in this particular one because at the Burke Museum, we have a small, it's about a, a seven foot tall a model of this uh, school cup pole at the Burke Museum. And this is it here. This is the original pole in Kaukan, and this is the CCC uh, uh, And that one hasn't been replaced yet. Uh, the bear tracks pole from Klink, Klinkwan here belonged to Duncan Ganawan, who, who was a Yakuvanis raven uh, related to the women who married into the Edenshaw family. Um, and this is the replica that went up here. And it has the bear, you can see them better in the old photo, but this is the original pole in Klinkwan with the bear tracks going up the pole. And that one they, it hasn't been painted yet either. <coughs> uh, okay, moving right along. I think we're going to that one next. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, there's some question about uh, whether that was a memorial for Moses Cool Keith. But um, uh, this is the CCC pool, and this is the replica here. I think that was a 2009 one. And there's the eagle from the outcam that's in the middle. That one, is that scheduled for next? This, this coming summer, this eagle is going to be um, replicated. And the, uh, they were moved uh, so that people could carve copies of them. Yeah. Yeah, the old poles. Mm -hmm. But it was the, the John Wallace uh, replicas that went up in the, in the thir late 30s. Yeah. Uh, single fin uh, killer whale memorial for Moses Kulkeep has been replicated. That's this one. That's the CCC call. Um, and this is uh, one of the corner posts from uh, Duncan Ganawan's house in Quinquan, the old post here. And the, um, John Wallace replica here. And this is the new one that just went up. Not last year, but in the year before. Uh, so there, there are four bear house posts in the center, um, and so a couple of bears that were out by the road that are, are no longer there because the road went there. But I just wanted to end here looking back. Um, and this is Dwight Wallace, the father of John Wallace. And here's one of these bears. Uh, they're posing, he's posing with his family in the village of Quinquan. And here are a couple of the other bears that were replicated in the Haukan Totem Park in the 30s. This is John Wallace who did the carving uh, in the 30s. Uh, and his descendants are still around Lee Wallace uh, in Kitchikan. Uh, he's been carving poles. And, and so um, I'll just end with this is the eagle and the old eagle from Haukan. And there was another eagle in Haukan, which uh, this, uh, I was so thrilled to see this last summer because I had known that it came from Haukan. I'd seen an old photo of it, and I, uh, there it is, and uh, there it is lying on its back. This is the, the old village of Klinkwan. Did I say Haukan? I meant, I, I, I meant to say Klinkwan. Um, it's the church that was built shortly before the, everybody moved north, but 
uh, perched up on the hill behind him, right next to it, I don't know if you could, oh, right over here, is an eagle. Um, that's the eagle right there. And it's now um, in storage in Heidelberg, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that uh, funding will be forthcoming to to uh, replicate this and, and put it back in, uh, put the replica back in Kumplan if we can uh, sing it. So, uh, so um, all of these culture camps end with feasting and great food and uh, I got to put the genealogy ch chart up on the wall and everybody came and took pictures of it and uh, yeah, so I, I had a great time up there. I highly recommend it if any of you have a chance to come up and join us this summer in Heidelberg. It's a fabulous experience. So, how a. presentation is about a certain aspect of canoe making, uh, conceiving the form of a canoe uh, in order to be able to steam it out successfully and effectively. Sort of the nitty gritty of canoe making. Uh, the most problematic part of it is that uh, you have to imagine, you have to carve something and then imagine the shape it's going to turn into. One, one card I know, uh, Norman Tate, years ago, I don't know if people have done this in, he carved a, a model for the finished shape, steamed it, and bent it inward to tell him what it would look like before the steam. That's pretty hard. Um, so pretty much everything I've, I'm focusing on here is intended to be uh, a kind of homage to the genius of the old timer, because I haven't also figured all this stuff out and made this incredible investment that one of the uh, clan leaders said the other night was really the foundation of the subsistence culture that I find of the subsistence culture. So uh, I certainly don't claim to know everything there is about this. I've made 12, 13 canoes on still and learned something about every one. I've made all these mistakes before. Because I know they don't work. But um, as uh, a young man, who uh, would ask me to help him devise it on a new project about 15 years ago that actually didn't work out because it worked out without getting a lot. He was from Swinomish uh, down in Washington. And uh, he heard about me and asked me to talk about this. And I said, somebody asked him, how come you're looking at that white book? said, well, it's true that white people have been largely responsible for the unraveling of our culture. And therefore, it's only right that some of the help us put it back together. So that's the, the spirit with which I uh, uh, make this presentation. And I'm titling it a possible misinterpretation of the program. I know it's, it's yeah, I know it's um, because I've made the same misinterpretation that other people have. So one of the problems with trying to relearn an old uh, technology like this uh, is finding resources. And photographs are one of them, one of the best, because there are a lot of old pictures of canoes. Unfortunately, there are very few that show canoes in the process of being made. Uh, and nobody really set out to document um, in photographs, that is. Uh, George Hunt uh, wrote a long description. Is this thing actually doing anything? This is the microphone? Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, 
But as far as visually, uh, the resources just don't exist. Here's a, a uh, Yakutat style canoe. You can see it's it's just carved to shape. The sides are pretty straight. At that point, the gunnels. I'd say the gunnel, of course, is the top edge of the side of the canoe. Um, this one might be in the Sitka area. It just shows a, a, a man wor working on an almost chicken, excuse me, um, working on a small canoe that's not yet steamed out. But there's not a lot of tremendous amount of detail that you can make out from either of these. This is a real valuable and important photograph. Uh, I believe in the taken in Hyde of Y. Um, the block in the center of the canoe, it's right in the middle uh, about a stern, is being knocked out. It was left in there and so that when you carve, you're carving the sides down thin, sides end up about an inch thick, the bottom about an inch and a half. And they have to be that thin. And uh, so they get really wobbly when you've got a long, straight side. And they would leave that block in there in order to support the sides and then take it out at the last. But, yeah, I, I'm trying to use it at such a small glass. So another thing it shows is that the gunnels, the top surface of the gunnel, this wide flat area here, starts out flat and then tips inward as it gets to the middle. That's because as the sides go out, that angle will change and become level. So that will all be level at the end. But now one of the things that this picture shows is this long straight side. The, the gunnel, the top edge is very straight. That's following, that's within the limitation of the log. And it, well, I'll go on to the next picture. That was a cedar log. Um, this was taken, I believe, at Old Metlakatla shows about a 30, maybe 35 foot canoe in sort of the same condition. The center block, if they used one, has been knocked out. Here you can see again the top edge of the gunnel kind of twists right here and is tipped inward. So here we're looking, because it's tipped toward us, we're looking almost right at the top of the gunnel. And here we're looking across the top of the gunnel. So it shows that the gunnel tips inward. It also shows this long straight side. Now, what I think is commonly misinterpreted, and which I misunderstood the first time I made a canoe in 1973, uh, was that th this gives you the impression that you can take a chainsaw and whack off the whole side of the log to get this shape. And the previous picture sort of lends the same, uh, lends a person to the same conclusion. But in fact, uh, if you take off too much of the, the width of the log and make the bottom, essentially you're making the bottom narrow, and you want to get the sides to go out in this nice wide curve, they, they, for one, they won't go that far if, if the bottom of them is restricted. And in the second place, it creates a canoe that has a narrow bottom and a wide top which is fine if you load it down because the deeper it goes in the water, the water wider the water line area gets, which gives it more stability. And if you use ballast, that will help. But otherwise, it gives the canoe to tip over this way and catch the cap side. But then it'll go this way and catch this way. And that means it's this kind of high, high centered kind of a thing. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Now this is a model that's uh, over in a photograph in the Alaska State Museum. It's old, it's kind of beat up, it's weathered, but it's a great old model. It shows a beautiful shape. And models are a really important source for research, for study, for canoe makers, because they really are blueprints. They're made, they're foreshortened, they're wider in proportion to their length than they would be in a normal full-size canoe. But they're, they're absolutely blueprints of the, the way they're supposed to look. It's the idealized version of the canoe in the final form after it's steamed out. So this is obviously a lot wider than it, oops, than it would be um, for in a full-length canoe. But that's typical of the models. It really doesn't change these relationships. So this one either sat um, outside or on in a grave house, who knows what, under a ho somebody's house, 
the bottom rotted out. But here you can see this beautiful long fair curve that is the, the gunnel at the top edge. And then if we look at other views of it, this is looking from the bow toward the bottom. We look how wide the bottom itself is. Now this is a little flatter because it's made to sit on something. But it's, it's, it's still wide like the bottom of a finished canoe should be. Now, I, the first, and other people I believe as well, have b thought that when you steam the canoe out, the sides will bring the bottom with it. It'll get wider, but it doesn't. In fact, the, reason, the only reason the sides are able to bend out is because the bottom flexes and the ends get closer together. So that, as, like this, the sides go out, the ends get closer together. Otherwise, if the, end, if the bottom isn't thin enough to flex, you try to bend the sides out, either the bottom, the sides will separate from the bottom, like this, which I saw happen on a model that was done in a class we did in Ketchikan several years ago. Someone didn't get the bottom thin enough, it wouldn't bend, and it, it just split this way, sep sides separating from the bottom. Or you're asking the sides to actually stretch, and of course they won't do that. So down at the waterline level, the, the hull has to be carved out to its full final shape before steaming. So only the gunnels themselves are bending out the upper part of the side. And we'll, we'll see other evidence for that. So um, here's again the same model. And you can see how from the, along the, what would be the waterline, the sides bend out way along here. And I'm talking about six inches up from the bottom, maybe a foot up from the bottom. But uh, it's a very, very important area right along there. And if that's carved straight, you'll never get it to, you see how they harmonize the bottom, the whole side of the canoe is one harmonious structure, uh, just like it was all made out of bent planks, right? So they're all bent on the same lines. So this curve at the bottom, maybe three inches up from the bottom on a full-size canoe, six inches up, has the same curve as the side does. So that's got to be put in it to begin with. This is a beautiful old canoe, the only uh, one that I'm aware of in this state, and it's one of the, the few on the West Coast, a uh, 35-foot Klingit canoe in Skagway. This was taken in 82. It doesn't look like this anymore, and it's not displayed upstairs hanging from the ceiling anymore. Um, I, I did some restoration work on it in 82 when I took this picture, and uh, now it's displayed downstairs at sort of floor level. But uh, in this, you can see, it's almost like looking at that model here on the left. You can see the width of the bottom and its relationship to the sides. And here, looking from the bottom up, looking up at the bottom, there's the bow down here, and you can see how that the bottom itself, so this, where this light is shining, is maybe six inches up from the very bottom of the canoe itself. So it's right around where the water line is, and how wide it is there, and how that curve is reflected in the curve of the gunnel up at the top edge. You can see the same thing looking toward the stern, here on the left, how wide that bottom spreads out. So here it's narrow again in the bow, see? It comes out, spreads way out like that. And you can't, you can't steam that part out. It won't push out. You're asking it to stretch. What happens? It would crack. You, you try to put, open it up, it cracks right along with the corner of the bilge. And that's a common problem. Um, the other view shows the inside of the canoe. Shows a lot of butterfly patches that I put in it. There were three or four in it when I first saw it. And there's also some stitching here to repair old cracks. So I used the same pattern for the but and sides for the butterflies and closed up some of these other patches. Uh, interesting to note, those, some of those cracks, this log had a huge spiral in it, and it didn't seem to matter to the canoe maker. Uh, the cracks, they run from high up on one side to down across the bottom to high up on the opposite side. So it's interesting that it chose that log, and it didn't seem to bother it. In any case, so there's the thwarts in there, and when you look at the shadows of the thwart, this is right up near the bow, 
but you can see how broad it is. But look at the next one back, how broad the corner of the village is back there. And back here, it's broader yet, see, toward the middle of the canoe. So that's the part that I'm suggesting has to be carved that way to begin with. Uh, I believe these are at New Kassan, um in the early 20th century. I believe this is the same canoe in two different stages. So here, it's been roughed out in the woods. You can see it's about six inches thick right there. Probably the whole hull was hollowed out till it was about six inches thick, right where the tree fell, just like that other photograph we saw. You can see the stump in the background. And then, uh, then the canoe is moved down to the water, floated back to the uh, village, where you didn't have to camp while you were working on it. You could stay in your house. And here, all this finish work that's being done with the ads, smoothing off that outside, refining the shape, is complete. Uh, here, the end block is not yet added on. And here, it is added on, which um, extends the height and change the angle of the grain in that piece. So rather than being parallel to the log, the grain of the wood in that piece runs up this way so that those top delicate ends won't break off so easily. Now here, you can see a big bulge in the side here. You can see that the side is fairly straight. If you looked at it from down, straight down on it, this would look pretty straight. And here, there's also a big bulge, and this has not yet been steamed out. So right from here to a place in the corresponding, the opposite end, that's all going to bow out six or eight inches in, in order to complete the shape of the canoe. The bottom, which it's hard to tell, you, know, you can see a little bit of a reverse curve here, starts out bent the wrong way, bent back and down on the ends, higher in the middle, so that when it spreads out, the ends come up and it turns out to be flat. All these have to be predicted into the shape. Uh, this is, I believe, Robert Davidson Sr. or Alfred Davidson's brother working on the big canoe that's now in the CC CMC in Ottawa, Canadian Museum of Civilization. It's uh, 55 feet, I think, thereabouts. And this is about 1906, maybe 1909. And he's, he's just uh, putting a patch across the center of the log there where there's some cracking and whatnot. But here you can see the end blocks not added on. You can see the beautiful adz finish on the outside of the hull. And you can see here how level the gunnel is. It doesn't continue this downward curve that it will when it's finished. So that lovely shear that a canoe has, that is the dip in the line of the gunnel, isn't there yet because that happens that as the sides go out, they get lower. And of course, it's the widest and the lowest in the middle. So you end up with this long, continuous curve. Well, it's not there yet because it hasn't been steamed. Oops, excuse me. And you can also see the shadow of the light there indicates this is quite a bulge right there on the side. It's not flat at all. It only tapers out here to the cut water in the bow. Oops, excuse me. So this, this is a west coast of Vancouver Island style canoe, but I was really excited to see this. This was found by some loggers out in the woods. There's a lot of these around the coast unfinished canoes. I've seen one on Edlin Island near Wrangell. I've heard of many others. Just about adjacent to just about every village there's people, oh, I, there's an unfinished canoe off so and so and so. And there's a lot of reasons why they were possibly unfinished. But it's really exciting to see them because it's like this is step six or something, you know. And this is the, the process that the original carver took. So interestingly, the, here the canoe is upside down. This is the bottom. This is probably, it's hard to tell, it's weathered off. It could be the bow or the stern. And here's the flare of the gunnel. Now that type of canoe, they add on the rise of the ends, a separate piece of wood. But here you can see, the and the bottoms are quite flat, but here uh, you can see the side come down. Here the, the where the canoe, end of the canoe tapers, the gunnel flare is there that is turning outward to the gunnel which is what turns the water out when you're going through the waves. But here, the gunnel line meets the outer edge of the log. So this is the full diameter of the log down here. He's essentially felled the tree, carved the canoe on top of the log, and then later he's going to separate that from the rest of the log. Here's the same one, um, opposite side. And again, you can see this is the roundness of the log right here. 
So everything is worked out to the total width of the log. We didn't come by and slab the sides off to get rid of extra wood. There is no extra wood. It all has to be used. And this other view shows really clearly that. So here's the actual shape of the bottom, the rounded, flatter across the center. And this is the way he's carved it. But now the sides drop down. And here, that's the full width of the widest part of the log right there. So that's going to be fared in. And you can actually have the, gun, the sides turn inward, following the shape of the log. And uh, the cottonwood canoes that the Chilkats made use that process to the extreme. Now, this is uh, these are very revealing drawings. These are marine architects' drawings of existing canoes. This is the 44-foot Shakes Hoots bear, brown bear canoe in um, the Smithsonian, Hootsjap. And these lines on there are formed from the lines in this drawing. So these vertical lines you see parallel to the center line of the canoe. This side is the bow looking from the bow. This is looking from the stern. That's why it's not the same height here. So these vertical lines are parallel to the center line. So I'm going to call those center lines. But they're 6, 12, 18 inches out from the center, 24 inches out from the center. Uh, the horizontal lines are what I'm going to call water lines, because this is 6 inches up from the bottom, or maybe 3. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a little ways up from the bottom a little farther up from the bottom, a little farther up from the bottom. So then, you go. in order to make these drawings, you take a, a little jig and you measure at these all these length stations so many feet apart, all these different uh, points on the canoe, and then the, this drawing connects all those lines. So here, this is the top of this drawing is looking down from the top. This is looking up from the bottom on the lower half. So here, all these long curved lines that we're seeing are these water lines, if you looked at it from the bottom. So this is the lowest line. And you can see the lowest line curves way out like that, just like the finished canoe. The next one does. The next one does. But then they start to get a little crowded together right in here. They start out more spread out, the, the finish where the, where the canoe is in the finished shape, carved in the finished shape. They start to crowd together here in the middle. Now this canoe presumably was already spread out, but I believe that it should be about any much wider. It probably was at one time, and somewhere between transporting it uh, from Wrangell to Washington D.C. and now, maybe the thwarts had to come out at some point, and the log returned to its original shape a little bit. I'm inclined to think. Um, but let's look at some others. Now, one other drawing that exists on here that's not on the others I'll call attention to. And this was uh, Bill Holmes' uh, approximation of what this would look like to start with. The dotted line is the carved form, and the solid line is what the canoe ends up at. So this is uh, just under six feet wide, as I recall, five foot ten now. And I think it ought to, ought to be a, a, a total of... 10 inches or a foot wider than it is now because it's probably shrank back. And there's indications to suggest that. This is the style of canoe that was in the uh, upside down carved on top of the log photographs. This one was made in 1928, it looks like there. Uh, and the carver's name, Conrad Williams, is here, a Quileute down at LaPouche, Washington. This is now hanging from the ceiling in Ivor's Salmon House. Uh, if you're ever down there, uh, want, wander in there and take a look. It's a beautiful view. All you can see is the bottom of it, you're looking up at the bottom. But it's a great view. It's a beautiful canoe made for seal hunting. So here again, now here we're looking at the water lines from the bottom. Here you're looking down from the top, so you see the thwarts and the floorboards and what have you. But here, this is like the six inches up from the bottom water line, and see that long curve there. And then each line, another six inches, another six inches, and then the gunnel line itself, that that outward slant is reflected in the way those lines uh, increase the width between them as they get to the wider part of the canoe. So 
that's how it should look, and the one, the other one, all those lines tend to converge down here, see? And if it was spread out a little bit farther, they'd look like these lines here, which is why I think the other one has fallen back a little bit. Now these lines are the vertical lines, the center lines. So this one is six inches out from the center, 12, 18, and finally right out at the end. So in a way, in order to make this work, you carve all this area right to the final shape, bow and stern. And this last area, which if you took, if you took the finished canoe and just six inches out from, or from the outer edge, and you just slice that part off, then that would be the part that was still within the confines of the log. And then when you steam it out, all these lines will line up, see? So I, I, I started uh, using a technique I'll mention more about in a minute. This is a northern canoe uh, from the Kwakwakiwak uh, in Alert Bay, uh, came to the Burke Museum in 1896. Uh, a gift of Jonathan Wanak of Alert Bay. I'm not sure if he was the canoe maker or not. And again, you can see the water lines here and the center lines here. Now this one too could be slightly wider than it is, but it's not as, as marked as the current condition of the Shakes canoe, which was, by the way, the Shakes canoe was probably a Haida made canoe. I don't know that then or now, I'm sure now you couldn't, because I've been around the woods around Wrangell. You couldn't find a tree big enough to make that canoe out of in Wrangell. And because that's the very northern end of the red, or close to the absolute northern end of the red cedar habitat, they just don't get that tall and that big there. So it was, the, it and the killer whale canoe were probably high to made and purchased by shapes. So then this is a small little model of a spruce canoe type it's made out of alder, but so I made this little model first as a bathtub toy for my son, and uh, it was a lot. It wasn't quite as finished as this is now, and then I borrowed it back from him, and because uh, I learned something more about spruce canoes by looking at it. But on it, I decided to draw the water lines and the center lines so that. Um, you see the same kind of line work on a three-dimensional object instead of a piece of paper. So um, here on the top, you can see these are the center lines as they come out parallel to the center of the canoe and how they mark themselves on the hull. So I just turned the hull on its side and rested a pencil on a piece of wood and just followed the shape of the canoe wherever the pencil line ended up. That was a straight line parallel to the center. And then on the, on the other side, I put the water lines by setting the canoe up vertically and running the canoe along pieces of wood that created those water line forms, which you can see a little bit better in this view. So I wanted, uh, sometime I'm going to steam this little canoe out. So I, I could steam it in a frying pan. But um, it needs to be wider. Not, I actually carved it in a little bit to get the practice out of it. So when that spreads out, then these uh, water lines are going to look different. So here, you can see they tend to converge. Here's the finished shape, and you can see each line is a little wider than the next. But here they converge. In fact, the upper ones disappear uh, from view because this is not yet steamed out. So these lines here are formed by bending a ruler and drawing them on the bottom. And then here are the, the center lines parallel to the center. So that's a work in progress. These uh, revealing little scraps of wood, plywood, and cardboard are templates taken off a 20-foot canoe we made in Wrangell um, in the late 90s. Uh, on the left is a template taken from right in the middle of the canoe, perpendicular to the center. And then, so here's the center line, and here's the curve of the hull all the way up, bends in slightly, and here's the gunnel. And that's the angle that the gunnel, pretty much the angle the gunnel starts out at, right in the middle. 
at the ends it's flat and it twists inward to this point and then here is a, the template taken off of the hull after it was spread steamed out here's the center line again now the gunnel's flat and that's the, the new shape so when you put the two together this is what you end up with so the, the plywood the darker one is the before it was steamed out the cardboard one is after it was steamed out this is three feet toward the stern from the center of the canoe this is right at the center of the canoe this too and there, there were, there's another set that's from three feet forward of the center but so here's the angle of the gunnel when it started here's the angle of the gunnel when it finished and this is pretty close to the to the diagram that Holm drew with the um, Shakes Brown Bear canoe. A li little less, there's a little more width right here. And these pencil lines on here are work, I call that the should be line. We were working in that case with a, we we're trying to make a bigger canoe out of a, not a big enough log. And if I'd had my druthers, I'd had about that much more wood. This is the actual right under the sapwood of the tree, right along there. And that was as big as we could get it. I'd rather it was another inch or more wider right there. And then you wouldn't have this little kind of a flat spot in this curve. But nonetheless, this is that canoe in progress. So I started, when I was working in Nia Bay in, in the 70s, uh, me and five uh, Macaw guys made four canoes that are now in the museum there in Nia Bay, have been since 79. And I came up with the notion of bending a sort of like a one by four as long as the bottom of the canoe or longer than and so here's the center line and then six eight inches out from the center uh, well it started tapering the log right from there so there's a slight bevel right from the center and then a bent a line in order to have a, a line to follow with an ads the old, this is not how I believe the old timer did it but this is a sort of a shortcut to the results that they obtain, is the way I would put it. So in order to have, like when working with apprentices, it's easier to tell them to follow this line than it is to say, okay, now make this nice, beautiful, long, fair curve that you may not quite understand, but this is what it's got to be. To give somebody, not only for an apprentice, but for myself, it's easier to follow a line because you can really only focus on a small area at a time. You're not seeing the whole line. So an old timer would add a row, step back, look, adds another row, step back, look, and keep doing that. See? Well, to sort of advance that process, this, this seems to work out. So um, anyway, each bend of the board, a little farther out at a different angle. So you angle it, you draw that line, you carve the next bevel where the ship adds, and then you draw another line on that bevel, carve change the angle, carve that, and then way out here. So this is the full width of the log right here. That's the sapwood right there. So this couldn't get any bigger. So if, if I took any of the outside of the log off, I'd have been short changed, and that's what I'm getting at. So here's just under the sapwood right there, and that's going to follow, from that point, the side of the canoe is going to follow the curve of the log right around to the top of the gunnel. A couple of different views showing the same uh, thing. So there's that full width of the bottom right there that it needs to have and then it continues to swell along this line as it drops toward the outside edge of the canoe. Here's uh, Will Burkhart who was working with me on a canoe, a different one. This is a 25 foot canoe that he and I carved in Metlakatla in 1983. Um, and that's one of the times I first started to use this process. And he's using a tool called the other side machine at least that's what Bill Reed called it he invented it and it's basically made out of a two by two with uh, some uh, quarter inch thick arms hinged here and a level in the top um, and by that you can measure from the center line to any point on the hull of the canoe you can move this up and down in and out and then measure that point turn it around to the other side and see if it's on or off in relation to the center line. So it, it's a high to invention. It's okay to use it. Uh, and then this is the back to the Wrangle canoe. This is the finished thing. The bubbles are all rounded off. That's a simple process. 
and it's all fared out. You can see the thickness measuring pegs are just set in the holes. I put them in there just for the photograph and then hammer them all down later on. Of course, that's how you know where to stop when you're coming out from the inside. So then there's the canoe, the same canoe before steaming on the left and after steaming on the right. So at this point, you can see that it, it turns inward slightly right here. So the gunnels actually come out and then they kind of come in and then back out again. And it was 28 inches from the outside edge of the gunnel here to the outside edge of the gunnel here. And we brought it out to 42. So that, that was 50% of the original width, 14 inches, 7 inches on each side. And we should, probably should have stopped at 41 because we got this one little crack down the middle. But it, it wasn't major. The water didn't even le all leak out. So we just patched that up with butterflies and gum pookie. But in there you can see the width, the water really shows the inside of the canoe and the width of the bottom there. And the fact is you couldn't get that kind of, it just went out without much trouble, a few hours of steaming. And um, that it, by following that method or something like it, you end up with sides that, that uh, reflect the width of the bottom. And then uh, the finished canoe, this is the day we launched it some months later. And then it's the first little trip by sail from, uh, it was steamed at the old uh, Wrangell Institute property and we paddled it up to where the old uh, cemetery was, which is about four miles away. We paddled the first half a mile or a quarter to a half a mile, then put the sail up and, and we, were, we almost beat the cars back to the other end because people had to go get in the car, turn it on, drive to the other because we got there in 30 minutes. So, um, and we paddled for the first 10. So, in the la that last, to um, get that four miles in the last 20 minutes, we were going like 10 or 12 knots with the sail, which was pretty steamy. But anyway, um, that's the end of my story for now. And uh, if anybody has any questions about any of it, talk to me later. Happy to share whatever I can. Thank you very much. Kenneth Chief, ho ho. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Gunna Chase, thank you. Um, I want to thank all the um, organizers of this event. And I want to thank everyone for having me here and allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Dave Huffman Maynard, and um, I know it's appropriate to introduce the rest of my family, but I'll be introducing them during the presentation. And I can never quite seem to edit down my images, so I'm going to be talking quite fast, and I might just kind of blaze over a couple of them as we go through. Um, you know I, know, I know it can be kind of a cliche today for Native American artists who talk about growing up in, or existing in two different worlds, but I quite literally did grow up in two different worlds, in two different houses, one of them 
uh, one experience was growing up in Anchorage, um, in this place here, um, as an urban uh, native person, um, in this kind of suburban landscape here. And then the other experience was growing up <coughs> um, as a uh, hippie uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, in this little uh, one-room cabin with uh, no running water, no electricity, no phone lines. We heated everything with our... Uh, Stuff. So, anyway, my, my parents, uh, you know, they always lived in different houses as long as I could remember. Um, this is our steam bath there in Fairbanks with my mother's design drawn on it, uh, painted on there. Um, and my work is really kind of an examination of what it is to be um, of two different cultures and growing up in Alaska. And this is a very early piece. It's not a very well done piece. I did it when I was in high school. Uh, but it's a, the per first piece I ever did kind of examining myself in relationship to culture. And it's a self-portrait. And behind it, you can't really see. But there's a, um, a, a painting of a Tlingit-style mask behind there you know, with the pieces dropping up behind. Um, <clears throat> right out of Kerr High School, I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and found a number of other like-minded artists there. And uh, At that point, it was only a two-year program, and at the end of our, uh, our program, uh, we put together this installation piece kind of examining um, the effects of uh, um, organized religion on indigenous peoples, um, and it was a collaborative project with three different artists. Um, but really, I have to uh, maybe give credit to the project to John McConville, who just finished 12 years of Catholic school before attending IAIA, uh, and I think it was really his uh, his uh, motivating factor for for this this piece. Uh, while going to school, I was uh, working my way through school, and I go up to uh, uh, work through the laborers hall and um, um, worked up in Prudhoe Bay, and um, you know so. People think about Alaska and this beautiful landscape, but they also have these experiences of this kind of, um, you know, this kind of industrial land um, out in the middle of nowhere. And Kruva Bay is a very odd place. Um, it's just a complete, complete um, oil industry place. Uh, um, so anyway, while I was at uh, IAIA, my uncle Larry uh, gave me his old 4x5 Pressman camera, and I still use that camera today when I'm using film. Um, I, 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 I enjoy uh, the idea that I'm kind of following along with his, um, his instruction. He's always been one of my uh, greatest influences in my work, and, and if you don't know his work, you should look it up. It's really, really incredible, and I, I find it extremely inspirational in my work. <coughs> So with my 4x5 camera, armed with um, you know, the tools of my ancestors, I set out to photograph and document. And, um, and at the time, it was uh, actually less expensive for me to drive back and forth while I was going to school. And I'd take my camera out and kind of photograph myself as I was going out. And you know, thinking about the, the way to use a camera, there's a, I kind of think of there's two different ways to use it. One to look out into the world, and the other way to look in um, as a tool for, for reflection. And that's the way I've always kind of use the camera uh, recording myself and oh one of my very first uh, form line design tries so please excuse the, uh, the, the form on that I've gotten a lot better since then um, while going to school <coughs> um, uh, up in Fairbanks uh, my dad had a property up there and um, um, I worked for a couple of years in trade for him and started building this uh, this house there um, as kind of my my contingency plan, if anything ever went wrong, I had a little house that I could go back to in Fairbanks, a little cabin. Uh, but, you know, using um, in the building trades and the constructions, I was using kind of the raw materials of that uh, uh, that trade for my work, using raw two-by-four materials and creating uh, the self-portrait with my mother. Um, They're pictured on the right, uh, Shirley McNeil, uh, who is Shirley Kozroyluk now. Uh, my grandmother is Anita McNeil, um, who was uh, Anita Brown, and um, was a sister to Judson Brown from Club One. On the right, or, uh, on the right is my father, Denny Maynard, and there's myself in the center, kind of creating this house, or this uh, symbolic house that I could kind of exist within, um, you know, kind of pulling from these two different cultures. And, um, um, after IAIA, I went out to California, did California College of Arts and Crafts in, in Oakland. Um, and I was only there for about a year and realized that, uh, you know, being an urban native in Alaska is very different than an urban experience in uh, Oakland, California, and um, moved back to uh, uh, 
in New Mexico <clears throat> to go to UNM, try to finish my degree there. Um, and uh, at the time, I was uh, writing back and forth with uh, John McConville, the person I did the um, uh, collaborative installation, installation with, and we found this warehouse space, and um, we were making art there and converted it into kind of a live workspace. And we had uh, bedrooms in the back and had our own dark room, and we built all of this stuff in here. And our dark room was back there, and bedrooms way back there. And we built a little kitchen and get up in the morning and make myself a cup of coffee and immediately just walk into the dark room and start printing and um, we had a welder set up in the background and while we were there <coughs> we there were a number of non-profit art spaces that uh, had gone under and you know we were young and naive and thought well we could open a gallery and so we opened site 2121 art space and I'm just going to kind of fly through some of these uh, um, we were a huge success uh, um, in one sense that uh, there were um, um, you know, the, the state um, uh, reviewers were calling us and letting, trying to get us to you know, let us know when their next show is coming along and we were instrumental in a number of different projects and we played through some of these uh, but you know we, um, we never made any real money on that and we had this really ridiculous low commission 20 percent. We were like a gallery for artists of artists, and um, um, we were part of the we were part of the 20 somethings uh, uh, in uh, New Mexico. Um, the, uh, part of part of that crowd. We helped put together on the Poetry in the Streets project um, and the windows in the downtown area, bringing installations in the downtown Albuquerque area. Um, and uh, we also opened a <coughs> studio spot in downtown Albuquerque and organized tours of different spots within uh, uh, within the downtown area. Uh, and it, but it was, uh, and at the same time, I was making my own work and um, um, creating these pieces, kind of based on on Raven and you know looking back at it. To, or, or, and and you know I, was, I, I like the idea of Raven as an artist. You know. This, this Trickster, this person that creates, or this entity that creates everything, but for his own, you know, selfish needs. And I was really kind of thinking of myself as, as Raven, and, and creating these pieces with uh, wings and such, and kind of becoming Raven. And um, <clears throat> in the early '90s, I had a uh, very art art accident where my wings caught on fire during a photo shoot, and I had uh, third degree burns and spent uh, a week in intensive care and had two skin grafts. Um, and, and the lesson that I took from this was that uh, killer whales should not pretend to be ravens. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so you know, I, after after uh, getting out of, the, out of the hospital and I started thinking about um, Raven and started thinking, you know, about questions for Raven as a creator and, you know, what these happened. This was a part of a show called the Post-Apocalyptic Tool Show, and I thought after the apocalypse we would want to... Uh, we would want to be able to talk to the creator to see what happened, and I also call this my first mask piece. Um, um, so this is another one, reaching for Raven, kind of having questions for Raven, and uh, trying to figure out where I'm going in my life and how to how to make a living as an artist. And and um, you know the idea of the the, the galleries that we would work there and live there and you know be able to make our art at the same time. But towards the end, we were both working full time jobs. Um, and trying to support the gallery and making many other people very uh, famous with uh, without their work. Um, and so in 2000, I moved back to Alaska. I cut my hair. That's my house. It's the, uh, as I came back to Fairbanks <coughs> um, and went uh, to work following my father into the labor's hall. Uh, back into the profession that he he followed, and and really for three years I was just trying to pay off debt, um, kind of, uh, um, figure things out a little bit, and um, um, decided to go back to school. I went to uh, UAF. Um, I had just a few few credits left to take um, to get my bachelor's degree, and I found this program there. <coughs> so I can go back there. Um, which I'd never really heard of before, which was the Native Art Center that had um, just this incredible group of artists uh, from Alaska that I um, was just in, in extremely inspired by. Uh, the program was started in 1965 by Ron Sanungatuk. There he is in the center. Um, and there's uh, Becky Atokiak, a great uh, drum maker, Bobby Nashukupuk over there, um, uh, the late James Grant, um, great artist there. Um, um, 
sister, or Kathleen Carlo, uh, great mask maker. I just found this, this really great community of artists up there, and the program um, <coughs> is, is kind of based on having visiting artists come into the program. You can get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in Native Arts, um, and I decided to follow that program and went into the program, got my degree there um, with a, a Master's of Fine Arts in Native Arts and a couple of different workshops. We were doing some uh, um, traditional brain tanning of uh, a caribou skin there, um, uh, processing of, uh, <coughs> of sinew, um, uh, some uh, processing of hides there, uh, basket making, um, and it really was this really nice kind of environment that I found. Uh, Sonia Keller Combs doing a workshop uh, with us. Um, and, and it was uh, just an environment that I thought was it, it's very nice. And, I, and part of the program um, it was really the first time in my education that I felt like I was able to see, look at the Tlingit material culture as the uh, foundation of the artwork. You know, all the other programs I went through kind of um, um, looked at other, other areas. And um, uh, Nathan Jackson there, uh, working with some students, and uh, Donnie Varnell came up and he worked a little bit, and um, you know, it was really, really just uh, um, really nice program, and and it influenced me quite a bit, and uh, I'm I'm very lucky. Uh, this is a pro, uh, um, an event where we brought artists. <coughs> Uh, from the Native Arts Center out to Old Harbor in, um, in Kodiak uh, with Sven Hawkinson there on the left, and, and he organized uh, part of it. There's uh, Alvin Amison Center there. And, um, just spent uh, about two weeks uh, creating art out on the island and visiting, and, and um, had a great time out there. Uh, this is a workshop with Melanie Yazi, um, his sister, Kathleen Carlo there. Uh, Melanie Yazi is a Navajo. Uh, printmaker, uh, she came up and did a print mark, printmaking workshop with us, and uh, you know it's a program that people come in and share knowledge, and um, you know it's it's an open enrollment program, uh, but we do end up having um, you know approximately 60 percent, 70 percent native enrollment into the program all the time. Uh, I really enjoy working uh, with young uh, native artists. <coughs> um, I started carving there. I thought it was very odd of uh, being a uh, Native American sculpture, uh, a Tlingit sculpture, and never carving before. And so I started on this process of carving and creating masks and thinking about masks as a you know, transformation experience and uh, looking at different parts of the material culture and thinking about my brothers and how we were, you know, we were a warrior culture at one time and where that kind of lost and, and with my brothers are. are or there seems to be this generation of uh, young Native men that are lost, and I'm thinking about how, how, how to bring them in, or, or what, 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 what are those elements that are kind of missing, and um, you know, being part of the warrior culture, so examining these, and um, so I've got a full set of these. All my brothers have them, some of my uncles have these. I've got uh, one left myself, but you know, thinking about that form, that beautiful form of the double-headed dagger, created this piece, which is a. Um, and it was during the time where we just started going to war, and um, so it's a sump glass with oil suspended in there. I call it my weapon of oil piece. You know, that we were going to um, you know, going to war over oil, and I see some parallels um, between lands claims and what happened with the indigenous people here in Alaska. Some other pieces based on those <coughs> uh, dagger forms. This is my double-headed dagger. Um, stands not not quite six feet tall, five four, something like that. Um, just gonna fly through some of these. Um, also, you know, as, as as a researcher and thinking about art and looking at art and constantly examining and finding. And in the Smithsonian collection, I came across this this description, and all it had was Dayakhin, the Tlingit shaman. Um, and so for a fee, you could send off for it and, and get a, a digital image of it. Um, this came back uh, um, with this image, um, and I was, you know, pretty sure that it was, uh, you know, a phonetic version of my name, which is part of the Dukwaiti, uh, part of the Dukwaiti, uh, um, and, um, you know, started putting myself into those images and thinking about them and, and, and thinking about the construct of those images as the, you know, they were done in the turn of the century by Case and Draper at a studio in, 
in Juneau, and um, their archives are in the state uh, state archives uh, in Juneau. And and you know, I was thinking about the construct that was created with these pieces. You know, all these different clan emblems kind of represented at the same time as props. And then going through the archives, finding the same person identified as a different person every time. You know, as a stage person. So. Um, I, I am interested in who this person is. If anybody knows who he is, please please let me know. Um, um, and, and I was fairly confident that he was uh, at least a clan relative, if not a um, not a blood relative. Um, uh, you know, I'm always thinking of, thinking about the systems placed upon Native American people. And this is part of you know my my uh, CIB card from, from way back when and usually have to explain what that is, but I'm going to skip that part. I think everybody knows what that is. I have this very odd birthmark, which is this um, uh, physical manifestation of my uh, dual cultural heritage. Um, and for years, I would harvest these pieces, uh, growing them very long, and never quite knew what I was doing with them, but, you know, dividing them up and thinking about, well, why... What, and then created this piece with it, you know, self-portrait piece um, entitled 716, which is my blood quantum. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think that's a very odd system that's placed upon uh, Native peoples. Like evolution series going from construction worker to failed businessman to, you know, contemporary Native artist going out into the world there. Uh, my mask pieces, you know, I don't, I don't sell my masks. They're, I, I think it's a little odd to sell culture, um, so I do, uh, they, they, they belong to the family, Each one of my family members um, has these masks, I keep on, and, you know, studying Tlingit culture, it always starts off, you read these books, uh, you know, about the rich material culture, but growing up as an urban native person, is not at all my experience, we were quite poor, and, um, um, you know, and the only images I really saw were in books, so I feel that part of the, my responsibility as an artist is to um, you know, create that richness uh, back again. Um, um, uh, these are some pieces kind of based on those knife forms again, and I mean, it was also during the time of the war, and I was thinking about that, um, the, the language of the war, like the sleeper cells, or these uh, series of masks where one what side of the eyes were open, um, with a, uh, the duck lady fin. Uh, there, representing that heritage, but also a, a you know, an ode to my love of old cars and you know, big pins and stuff like that. It's hand metal, hand formed metal, and then welded together. Uh, another set of masks with the eyes closed. They call my sleeper cell masks. You know, we have to be, you know, culturally awakened at any point. Um, those eyes open. Uh, another piece there. Uh, those daggers are eight feet tall, um, all um, welded steel uh, pieces. <coughs> And four of those in the series. Uh, this was a, um, a series that started off with a very odd show entitled uh, Dry Ice, and it was about uh, uh, Native Americans looking at the landscape. And I, I was invited into the show, and I immediately thought, well, I'm, I'm not a landscape artist. What am I doing here? You know, reaction. But, but I do have a relationship to the landscape. I, mean, I do go out there quite often. This is the um, <coughs> the dirt road there is the uh, Trans-Alaskan right-of-way, which is just a mile and a half from our, our house in Fairbanks. And I travel that road quite often and snow machine it and we pick blueberries along that road. And started thinking about, you know, this, this, this line that cuts across our state, um, you know, the billions of, of, of gallons of, of fuel that go through there. And, how it just is suspended over bridges and um, you know right over the place where I fish and, um, um, and 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 three years ago I was uh, blessed with a with a baby boy and there's my mother there uh, Shirley um, and um, um, at the last celebration uh, I, I my son was just a, extremely interested in the dance form and dancing and drumming he's already. Uh, beaten through his first drum head and had to replace that one. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, this so, sorry about the, the audio there.
know, that's after celebration coming back and um, he's uh, uh, just loves drumming and song and um, I, I am not I'm not a singer um, I think about language and songs and, um, but, but they did inspire me to create these pieces that are based on drum form uh, you know, uh, my connection with language I don't, I don't know if these phrases here or there uh, but, but the, the parts of language that I do know that I want to pass down to my song are, is the song um, and so I've been doing these pieces uh, based on drums Strength. And these are uh, just a few very short pieces that are going to be part of my solo show at the Anchorage Museum in September. So if you're there, come on up. Um, I do teach at the uh, program now in Fairbanks at the uh, Native Arts Center. If you're interested in an MFA or BFA degree, please come up and see me. Or if you're ever in through town, please stop by. So much peace, so much peace. Thank you. Thank you, uh, one and all, for sh uh, sharing your lives with us this afternoon. We have some great presentations. Thank you, Robin and Lisa and Doreen and Jacob and Steve. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, we are running a little uh, overtime, and so if you do have to go, we, our uh, banquet starts in uh, about uh, 20 minutes. So. Is it, is it 5.30 or 6.30? 6.30, okay. So we have a little bit of time. and So please, if you have to go early, uh, you're more than welcome to duck out on this. But I'll, I'll try to shorten this up a little bit, too. The, the topic of my presentation has to do with uh, several types of, of Klingit headgear that I've always been intrigued by. And um, uh, I've uh, uh, studied some of Bill Holmes' work in this area of the... Uh, Relationships between uh, Klingit, some Klingit style headgear, and, and uh, the headgear worn by Aleutic and Aleut people in Alaska. And also Lydia, uh, Lydia Black, has, uh, her work on the Bentwood hunting gear has also been uh, of interest to me as I've looked into this topic a little bit. But this, this is a early watercolor showing uh, Klingit, Aleutic, and Aleut. Uh, wearing different types of headgear, but uh, these types of headgear are also something that was shared in common by these people, and uh, all, all of them had ritual headgear, uh, some designed for shaman, shamans to use, other uh, more uh, ceremonial, uh, worn by people who weren't shaman. This is an early uh, illustration of uh, Aleut, uh, Aleut ritual, and you can see the uh, dancers have some uh, peak uh, hats. One looks kind of bird-like. Another one comes to uh, uh, has a very pointy top on it. And, and we see similar headgear worn by uh, in Southeast Alaska by Klingit people. This is from the 1904 potlatch here in Sitka. And the man in the center has a, a distinctive kind of peak hat. Uh, it's got a decorated headband and comes to a peak at the top. And, and here's some other headgear from the North uh, North Pacific Coast. Uh, uh, some of the uh, seal helmets worn by uh, sea, uh, kayak hunters in Prince William Sound. And also the spruce root hats decorated in a distinctive Olympic style. So there are some similarities to Klingit art. Uh, out on the chain, you get more into the Bentwood hunting gear uh, for the sea hunters. These were helmets that were actually worn during the hunt for sea mammals, and so they, Lydia Black has shown that they, they had a, a protective function for the hunters and also um, uh, may have assisted in attracting the animals to be, uh, uh, to be hunted. And these are bent wood in that they're made from very thin planks that are bent with steam and hot water around. And some are, uh, these are closed crowned. They come to an actual peak at the top. And these are the open crown visors. 
and these often have uh, ivory attachments on them. Uh, many of them have sea lion whiskers uh, or feathers on them, sometimes trade beads. So very highly decorative and uh, uh, these are, are more used out on the Alaska Peninsula, the Aleutian Islands, and also southwest Alaska, the Yupik country. There are, these are some that come from uh, very far out on the Aleutian chain into uh, the one on the, uh, the right is actually from Kamchatka and the other one comes from somewhere along the, the uh, far western chain. These are, uh, are actually, uh, the one on the left is not a bent wood hat, it's carved out of a solid block of wood but in that elongated bent wood style. The one on the right is a, is a real um, odd duck. It's a duck bill type, but it has this bulbous portion on the top that is uh, is very curious. And this this is the only one that has been identified of this exact form. And actually, there's a lot of Well, there, most of the weight is in the back, and the, there's weight from the ivory. There's a back piece, and also on the sides there are some volutes that are ivory, and that helps weigh it down. They also have a chin strap, and it's actually kind of cool to put one on because it's it magnifies the sound to your ear. So if you're hunting, you can, you know, it sort of like picks up like radar or something. If you hear a splat, you can hone in on it. So anyway, the, this one uh, uh, duck build uh, hat that's made out of wood ha has some resemblance to uh, the Japanese samurai style helmets with the, that has a visor. These are made out of metal and, and lacquered uh, and lacquer work around the back there. But it even the samurai hat has these little insignias on either side of the, the bill that are kind of reminiscent of the one from the Kamchatka. But we see uh, these elongated, uh, these headgear with the elongated bills in southeast Alaska also. This is a dancer from Wrangell wearing one, and this appears to be carved out of a, a single piece of wood rather than a thin plank that's bent around like the done out on the chain. But uh, the usual explanation for why this kind of headgear is in southeast Alaska is that the Klingit dancers are performing songs or songs and dances that they that originated from the alley. And they tell stories about going up into that part of Alaska on raiding and trading expeditions and also there were Aleuts and Aleutic people that came to southeast Alaska with the Russians. They, the Russians had them hunting sea mammals, sea otters, primarily down here in southeast Alaska. So that's two possible ways that those peoples came together in addition to, to trading for years and years. Uh, this is one that, uh, I guess that's in the Fog Collection in Cooperstown, Steve's written about it. Uh, and this is carved out of a single piece of wood, although it has this this rim that comes out that's, that's suggestive of the Aleutian uh, Bentwood cast. And this one, though, has a, a three-dimensional crest figure on it. It looks like at one point the, the, uh, the brim had sea lion whiskers attached in those holes all the way around, and, and that's also on this one has a lot of whiskers around the back, and then down from the brim in the front, those are genitalium shells with little tufts of yarn or, or fabric hanging from the end. So they're very, very flashy uh, headgear, lots of color and movement too with the whiskers and the shell attachments. There's, when someone wore this, it was just moving all around as they knew. Now this is one in the Portland Art Museum. It looks like a sea lion coming out of the front and has the dangles from the, the brim. This is a, a really interesting one that was at an auction uh, in the 80s, I think, and it has uh, uh, a, uh, the lower part carved of wood is is very similar to the shape of the Aleutian Bentwood caps, but this one has a stack of the basketry rings on that top. At least they're made to look that way, but I'm not sure that they actually are separate rings 
as you would expect in a basketry hat. It looks like it may be a, a cylinder of basketry that has three strands twining around at various places to suggest the, the uh, separations between the rings. But I thought that was interesting, though, because uh, uh, Ivanov, a, uh, the art historian from Russia, who wrote about the Aleut Bentwood hats, he, he noticed the resemblance between these these uh, Bentwood hats that the Aleuts were using and Klingit uh, helmets, and he even called the Bentwood hats war helmets because there was a uh, suggestion that they related to uh, Klingit hats. And on this particular hat, he, he saw those painted circles at the very peak of the hat as being a resemblance to basketry rings on the top of the hat. And even though, you know, I didn't think that much of that idea at the time, and then I saw this one that actually had basketry rings on it from the, uh, from the Klingit, that uh, I, I uh, noticed that, that those uh, two ideas kind of came together there in that one hat. So uh, in, in contemporary times, that, uh, such as that celebration, we see people wearing modern versions of this uh, alley style hat. They're, they're like baseball caps with a very long uh, bill. And this particular one, however, by uh, uh, Ethan Pettigrew, he's uh, originated from from the alley and was uh, lived in Wrangell for a long time and danced with the dance group there, and he made a, an actual alley gentleman hat and wore it at celebration. So shifting gears a little bit, I also wanted to make mention of, of this this form of hat, which uh, there are, these are extremely rare. Most of them are in European institutions, and they came from the Aleutian Islands originally. It's a, a flat-sided hat that has a head, decorated headband a strip of decoration that would be over the forehead, and a lot of them have this tall neck that goes up with a, that's down turned at the top to suggest maybe the head of a bird, and in fact that's uh, what these, uh, this headgear was meant to represent according to the, the Russians. The, uh, this part is the, the head of the bird, a long neck, this is the body of the bird, and it has kind of this slanted, this Collar at the front and at the back, so it slants down. And a lot of them have these trailers coming down the back. And these have this incredible embroidery using uh, dyed animal hair that's sewn and makes these complex embroidered parts that are really quite amazing. And this is one that's one of the few that's in North American collections. This is at the Smithsonian and it's in somewhat deteriorated condition. This uh, upper part was once a uh, highly decorated uh, head and neck part, but that's all been shredded now, unfortunately, but it still has part of that down the back, and it's all kind of braided together, and it had a, a strip uh, along the opening that went around your, around the forehead, and that, that probably had was bird skin that the lower part of the headgear was bird skin and all the feathers and stuff out of it. Here's another example of it. Uh, you can get a sense of how incredible the embroidery and, and weaving is. I guess it's, it's like braiding or weaving of this in, uh, dyed hair, animal hair. These are in the Peter, Peter the Great Museum in St. Petersburg. These are more intact with uh, Bird skin foundation with this, uh, I think this might be uh, this uh, steel esophagus, I think, with this uh, colored black with graphite with the embroidery over the top. There's another one that doesn't, some of them don't have the long bird neck and head up here. It just kind of cuts it off sharp, but the, the form of the hat still is suggestive of a seabird floating on the water. So you see these kinds of hats in, in Southeast Alaska as well. They're primarily considered shaman's headgear. Uh, Dale Aguina reported that they were called war bonnets because shaman, when they, when they were doing battle with spirits, they would put these on. And um, a lot of them actually have bird um, decoration at the, the very top front of the hat. These have 
carved wooden bird steps on it. And they have that same kind of sl slanted back shape. A lot of these have uh, uh, the main hair from uh, moose on the back or caribou possibly. Some are, are made out of that spruce root basketry. In fact, the shaman's hat pattern, they call it shaman's hat pattern because it's got that distinctive pattern on, on them. And some of these have quadrupeds or maybe birds that are embroidered or uh, decorated in false embroidery on the sides. A few of them are made from sections of cut up uh, Chilcat robes. Uh, the one on the left, uh, another dancer from Wrangell has one of those, and instead of a, uh, for the neck of the bird, he's got a, a Chinese feather duster. You can see that slant, back slanted shape, and there's a, even a trailer on the back that's similar to those alley versions that we saw. And so he, uh, here again, you know, this is a, uh, in some, at some times a, a dancer might, uh, a dancer who's not a shaman might wear a hat like this in a, in more of a secular context, uh, but actual shaman did wear these as well. Uh, and uh, uh, the Russian ethnographers noted that uh, the Elliot versions of these were worn by shaman and they were made to represent birds because birds are, are considered to be very powerful hunters and they also are, exist in, in three, um, three worlds, the world of the air, world of the surface of the water and the undersea world as well. It can live in all three of those worlds and so it's considered to be very spiritually powerful as a creature. And the shaman also uh, resides in the spirit world as well as the, the everyday world. So uh, some of the Klingit war helmets uh, uh, also take on this basic shape with a bird's head at the top. Uh, it kind of comes to a ridge along the top from front to back, slanted down from the front. A lot of these have a strip of hide that's uh, nailed on the top, and uh, some of them have a, a headband decoration. And uh, there's a possibility some shaman did go into battle sometimes, possibly they wore a, a, uh, a combat version of their war bonnet uh, in the physical combat. Uh, the, the soft version, uh, this, this, the, uh, the kind made out of basketry or chilcat, uh, those wouldn't be providing physical protection in battle, so they, maybe they carried a, a wooden version that they could actually wore that would be capable of, of uh, if they actually engaged in combat. But usually the role of the shaman in battle was to fly ahead of the warriors and spy on the enemy and engage the enemy shaman and spirit combat. Some of the, uh, the basic form of this kind of hat may have been turned into crest hats at some point, like this beautiful moon headdress in the Seattle Art Museum that comes from the Juno area. That's this long neck and head similar to the evolution form. And I, I wanted to end now just by saying a few words of another form of headgear that's uh, that's a, a kind worn by women that you find all along the Gulf of Alaska. It's a, a skull cap with a trailer, and these are made from beads uh, kind of uh, tied together or else sewn onto a foundation. The, uh, the Alutic and uh, Yupik version of these caps are usually just netted together. They don't really have a solid foundation that they're on. They're just strung onto uh, loops of, of leather. The one on the right, I believe that's uh, a loop kick. That one's got a leather cap underneath it that the crazies are going on to. These, a lot of them, will have a trailer that goes down the back and then two pendants that hang on either side of, of the face. And there's also a uh, several of these that were collected in Southeast Alaska that, that uh, take on that same form. This is one of the more famous ones from Mrs. Burner's State Gym. That's a relative of uh, Mari Downhauer. And this one has uh, several hundred dead alien shells and, and glass trinkets on it. So it's a really spectacular piece. So I think I'll end it there. And uh, 
I appreciate you coming out today and uh, hearing, hearing from our, our fantastic presenters. Thanks again, you guys, for helping out. We sure appreciate it. And uh, in about an hour, we'll start our banquet over in the uh, auditorium. Thank you very much.